class? Today is the final class of uh, Riverbend Graduate School of Theology. Our study, which we have been doing for the final, for the last month, is now coming to a close. And so I want to prepare you for your final exam. Your final exam will be a take-home test. And in order to prepare for this take-home test, we are going to talk about three letters, and I need you to define what these three letters represent. S, D, G. Now, in order to do that, I want you to take out your phones. Go ahead and take out your phones. And you scan the QR code, and it will come up to a website called menti.com. And there, it will ask you to type in what you believe these three letters, S, D, G, represent. So go ahead and do that and type in your answers and we will collate them and we'll review them before class is dismissed today. Now, there may be some of you here who may be tempted to cheat on the final exam. And so you may Google while you are pretending to dial up the menti.com, and uh, you might type in SDG and Google that, and I can tell you exactly what you will find. Because if you Google the letters SDG, the first two or 300 citations that Google will give you for what the letters SDG mean are all the same thing. Google will tell you that SDG represents a program that was started in 2015 at the United Nations. And it's a program of what they call Sustainable Development Goals. In 2015, the United Nations, and apparently with the cooperation of Google, decided that the most important mission of humanity was, as they defined it, 17 goals for creating a better world. And they humbly described this mission of SDG as a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that by 2030, all people enjoy peace and prosperity. We are halfway there, ladies and gentlemen. Aren't you seeing the peace and prosperity flowing out from the United Nations since 2015? If you Google SDG, the first 100 citations, or maybe two or 300 citations, refer to that. That's not what we're going to talk about today. I thought it would be good to quiz our staff, those people who have devoted their lives to serving you, to serving Jesus here at Riverbend Church, and I asked them, what do you think SDG meant? Remember, these are your spiritual leaders. And some of the answers that they gave for what SDG meant, I think we have a slide that contains some of them. Do we? There. Simply divine grace. That's not bad. Here's an interesting one. Seriously delicious guacamole. <laughs> Here's one that I liked. Super duper great. These are your spiritual leaders, ladies and gentlemen. Then there was so darn good. But if I remember right, they didn't use the word darn. They were more expletive. And then one that I tried not to take personally on this Father's Day. Somewhat dramatic grandparent. These are your spiritual leaders here at Riverbend Church. Now, I would be misrepresenting them if I didn't tell you that there were a few of them who understood what SDG means and what it represents in Latin. What SDG represents is the final of what we are studying, the five soli, or the five solas. These are the five pillars of Reformation theology from the early 1500s when the Protestant and the Catholic Church parted ways. And over the last four weeks, we have studied the four previous solas. The first one is sola gratia, or grace alone. The second one is sola fide, or faith alone. 
The third one is sola, solus Christos, or Christ alone. And the last one, the one we studied last week, is sola scriptura. We come to the fifth sola, which is SDG, soli deo gloria. Now, for those of you who are paying attention to the Latin grammar, you'll notice that the nominative case is used in all four of these first four solas, masculine and feminine, feminine being sola, 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 solus, solus Christus being the masculine, but it's the nominative case. It's the dative case in the final one, soli deo gloria, literally means you translate the dative of the Latin with two or four. It literally means for God's glory alone or to God's glory alone. And so the letters SDG, in my mind, represent the culmination of all of the other solas. By grace alone, by faith alone, by Christ alone, by the scripture alone, God receives the glory alone. And so our final exam will have to do with what does that mean? And today I want to clue you in on what it means, what soli deo gloria means to me. What soli deo gloria means to me is two simple words. We win. At the end of all things, we win. Soli deo gloria. Now, how can I say that, given the world that we live in? Well, that is the subject of our study this morning. But before we engage with SDG and what it means, I'd like to pray. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I would ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, and that you would use your words spoken by your servant and anointed by your spirit to envelop us in a sense of your grace, your faith, your word, and your son. And in that way, may we recognize that we are held in the glory of your presence. On this Father's Day, I pray that we might really understand the hope we have in soli deo gloria. Pray that for myself, for my family, and for all of us here, for I ask that, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Maestro. That's Greg Giancarlo, the Giancana, the professor. And what he was playing was called a composition by Johann Sebastian Bach from the early 1700s that was invention number four in D minor. Johann Sebastian Bach wrote 15 of what he called inventions. And they were designed as tutorials for his music students. And Bach was exploring a new form of composing music on the new instrument, the harpsichord, which the piano had not yet been invented or perfected. 
And with the harpsichord, Bach was creating two melodies, one played with each hand. It was called counterpunctual composition. And it was revolutionary in the Baroque era. But Bach was not the only one who was working with counterpunctual composition. His contemporary, a man named George Friedrich Handel, was also doing counterpunctuary compositions. And you may remember George Friedrich Handel from that little composition he created called The Messiah and the Hallelujah Chorus. These were experiments in a new harmonization and a new way of composing Western music. But Handel and Bach didn't just have their music in common, they were both men of great faith. And they both had a peculiar habit. They both, when they finished a composition, would not only sign their name at the end of the composition, they would write the letters S. D, G. They marked all of their compositions with the three letters, S, D, G, which in their minds represented the Latin soli deo gloria, for God's glory alone. It was their way of representing their reverence, their adoration, giving the credit to God. And when, we, when, when you hear Handel's Messiah played in this day, over 250 years after its composition, you realize the power and the beauty of that music. And they wanted to make sure that the people who played their music, the people who appreciated their music, understood that they were giving all of the glory to God alone. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, you can applaud, but let me ask you this question. What happened when the composition that they did sucked? You can't, you can't imagine that every piece of music that they wrote was brilliant and masterful. There had to be compositions that Bach and Handel wrote that were just okay. There were probably some where people listened to it and went, there's too many notes. It's, it's too confusing. It's too complex. No one will ever appreciate it. There were critics back then, just as there are today. So did they sign? SDG, was it for God's glory when their music was mediocre, when their music was awful? You see, this is the real question. The question isn't just about the compositions of the music of Handel and Bach. It's a question of the composition of our lives. Does God get the glory in the difficult times, in the awful times, in the times when evil prospers? Does God only get the glory in the beauty and the majesty and in the comfortable times? Or does God get the glory in everything? See, for me, logically, God has to get the glory in all things. Just as the composer gets the glory for the beauty of the music and the blame when it's mediocre or awful, or the architect, or the builder, or the chef, or the creator. If God is the creator, then God gets the glory for the good and the bad, for the beautiful and the awful. But how does that work? How do we operate in an SDG way in a world that's, that's filled with difficulty, that, that, that's filled with challenge, that's filled with struggle and pain? Well, I want us to root our hope in a promise. There's one chapter in the entire Bible that is more hopeful than any other. It is in the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the young church in Rome and the chapter of hope in the centerpiece of the Bible is Romans chapter 8. And at the center of Romans chapter 8 is the most hopeful verse in the Bible. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 begins by saying, We know that all things work together for good. You want to know what SDG means? It means Romans 8.28. All things work together for good. 
Perhaps you've seen that verse before. Perhaps you've seen it on a plaque at Hobby Lobby or a Cracker Barrel. Or maybe your grandmother needle pointed it into a pillow that is on her parlor, in her parlor. It is a hopeful idea that in all things we can know that they work for good. That is the definition of SDG. It is the foundation of hope. But if you read just a little bit further in Romans 8.28, you realize that there's not a period after good. There's a comma. And the Apostle Paul says, all things work together for good for two groups of people. To those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Oh, okay, so, so what does this mean? Well, there are two options for understanding what this means. The first is the quid pro quo, the cause and effect. All things work together for good because you love God and because you are operating according to his will, according to his purposes. So all things work together for good if you love God, then all things will work together for good. If you are living according to his purposes, then all things will work together for good. But do you see the problem with that? The problem with that is how much? How much do I have to love God? I mean, a little bit and things will go just really kind of good? And if I love God a lot, they'll go really great? Well, that's not the real problem. The real problem is the real world that we live in. Because I see people all around me who are, who are wealthy and successful and prosperous, who are living lives filled with blessing, and they have nothing to do with God. They have no interest at all in loving God or living according to God's purposes, but their lives are blessed beyond measure. You realize that 85% of all of the billionaires in the world identify themselves as either atheistic or agnostic? How is it that they love God and God is blessing them and they don't care? And not only that, but I see the inverse all the time. I see people who desperately love God, who are devoted to their faith, who are faithful and kind and honest and, and self-sacrificing and humble. And they live according to God's will and they, and they try to do all of the things that they believe God had intended for them and their lives are crap. And they're full of trouble and struggle and, and cancer and divorce and wreckage and ruin. And they love God with all their heart. And things are not going well. So what do we do with it? What does SDG mean? If the hope is that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose, well, it's not quid pro quo. See, it's simply a matter of perspective. All things work together for good to those who see things from God's point of view. From the composer's point of view, he knows how the symphony resolves. From the composer's point of view, he knows that in the middle of the symphony, there will be minor keys and a tempo change and, and, and the darkness will come in, but he knows how the composition ends. All things work together for good to those who see things from God's point of view. You see, every once in a while we get that. We get a glimpse of it. It's the insight of hindsight. It's, it's forensic perspective. It's, it's seeing the fingerprints of God as we do archaeology on our lives. You know what it looks like? It looks like the 13-year-old the, the young boy whose girlfriend dumps him right after the, right after the middle school dance. And he goes home to his parents and he's, my life is over, my life is ruined. This, this girl was the, the love of my life and, and, and now they hate me and, 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 that, and, and that young boy is destroyed. And in that pain, in that grief, he has, to, he has to find his way back to wholeness. And then he goes to his 40th year high school reunion and he sees her and he goes, thank God I didn't marry that crazy person. Oh, my word. Look how they turned out. They are a full nutbag. And man, God, you saved me. That's the insight of hindsight. 
That's the fingerprints of God. That's God's point of view. And God says, you may not see it right now, but all things will work together for good. But the Apostle Paul isn't done. This promise is attached to two more verses. In verse 29, he says, for those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that they might be the firstborn, that he might be the firstborn among his own brothers and sisters. Now Paul is starting to get theological here and he rolls two theological grenades out into the conversation. Foreknowledge and predestination. And he says it is God's design. God knew from the beginning what your life and my life would be like. Our life would be like the life that Jesus lived. Now, how did his, how did his life go? Did he ride around in limousines with people fawning at his feet, live in palaces with people fanning him and peeling his grapes? Did Jesus live a life of luxury and, and comfort and, and, uh, and a life where, where he had no pain? No, he lived exactly the opposite life. He, lives, he lived the life that we live. Life covered over injustice and in struggle, or he was betrayed, or he was ultimately beaten and tortured, or he ultimately died the death of a, of a criminal in the most brutal way possible, and he was thrown into a grave, and the stone was rolled over it as if his life would be completely forgotten. God foreknew that we were predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. This is the life that we live. So that he might be the firstborn among us. Because he was the first one who showed us that the stone rolled away. And the end of the story wasn't the grave. And he showed us that we are brothers and sisters of the resurrection. And that all things work together for good. That even though now God foreknew that we were predestined to be conformed to the image of his son and and to live that, that gritty, hard life, that life that I hate to break it to you ends exactly the same way for 100% of us. None of us gets out of this life alive. No matter how wealthy, no matter how comfortable we are, we all come to the same end. But it's not the end, you see, because all things work together for good because he is the firstborn among many brothers and sisters of the resurrection. But the rabbi Paul is mean. He is a theological theological nerd of the highest order, and he, he creates a theological charcuterie board in verse 30. Begins in verse 29, those God foreknew, and, and he, he, he gives us five words. And the first one is foreknew. And then he said he predestined, predestined. And then in verse 30, he says, those he predestined, he called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. Now, those five theological terms have driven theologians mad for 2,000 years. They are a cabal of of, of theological understanding. And if we had two more hours and we could go through each of those words, we would just begin to skim the surface of what those five words mean and how they relate to SDG. I can tell you, I spent three years studying those words. Three years of my life that I can never get back. It began in 1993, and that was a a terrible time in my life. In 1993, I had just finished all of my classroom work for my doctorate. It was supposed to take two years. It took me five Took me five years, A, because I'm not that smart, B, because I was a, a young pastor in a small church that wasn't doing well, and I was, I was hand fighting with the elders and with the people, and it was just ministry. And I, and I, was, I was a young dad. I had three pre-adolescent daughters. 
we had no money. My wife was, my wife had gone back to teaching, and I was struggling to get through this, this, this program because I had committed to finish. I wasn't going to quit. And after five years, in 1993, I had finally finished my classroom work. In fact, I had just finished, at the end of 1993, my dissertation proposal. If you're familiar with how many of these programs work, you have to close your doctoral studies by writing a dissertation, a research paper. And it has to be, it has to be a research paper that has never been done before. It has to be groundbreaking. It has to be new information, particularly in the field of theology. And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but people have been studying theology for thousands of years. Everybody has talked about everything to death. So finding this idiosyncratic subject that you can do research on took me months. But I finally finished my dissertation proposal, and it was approved. And my dissertation was going to be on these five words and their relationship to hope and how they supported a, a person in a, a trouble-filled life. And I was going to base my study of hope on Romans chapter 8. And for the next three years... I worked on this dissertation, and it, and it wasn't because I wanted to. It was because I had two friends, Renee Johnson and Robin Hardy, who insisted, because they helped me write the dissertation proposal. Renee Johnson was this, or is this, genius creative, and she would always come in and say, how's it going, how's it going, what have you got, what have you got? And Robin Hardy was an author, is an author, and she, she actually had... Back in 1993, she had a word processing, a Xerox word processor in her garage. She was a writer, took up half of her garage, but she could, she could take my typed notes and print them out in perfect Turabian form. And they said, you just give us the pages. You just write four or five pages a week and we'll put together your dissertation for you. And for three years, they would come into my office and they go, where are your pages? Where are your pages? I hated these women. And I would hand them these pages, and they would, they would edit them, and they, and they basically wrote the dissertation. And this is it, 454 pages. This, uh, yeah. Yeah. I can't even tell you what I think about this thing. But, but in this dissertation, there are 45 pages that have to do with these three verses from Romans chapter 8. There are 14 pages in this dissertation that talk just about those five words. There are three pages that just talk about how these five words are all in the aorist tense. They're all in the past tense. They're already done. It is a constative aorist. And, and so I finished this, this labor in 1996, and I get a letter from my dissertation advisor. Dr. Dennis Dirks, who is the dean of the School of Theology, and he says, you're going to pass, and we're going to give you your degree, but I have a friend who works as a publisher, and I think you have the makings of a book here. And so you should reach out to him and see if his company would be interesting in pu interested in publishing it. And I didn't want to write another word in my life. But... He said at the end of his letter, I hope, I hope to see this in print someday, and he wrote the letters S-D-G and signed his name. So I remember calling him. I said, Dr. Dirks, what does S-D-G mean? And he was a professor, so he said, look it up. <laughs> and this was before Google. And I, I believed that the dwelling place of Satan was in a card catalog. If you know what a card catalog, and I wasn't going to go back and look up what SDG meant, and I just happened to stumble on Soli Deo Gloria. And I just happened to write a book. They reached out to me from the publisher in Wheaton, and they said, and I gave them a proposal for three books. I'm going to write a book on faith, a book on hope, and a book on love. And the book on faith would come from Hebrews 11, and the book on love would come from 1 Corinthians 13, and the book on hope, this one right here, would come from Romans chapter 8. And this book was published, and don't go looking for it, it's way out of print. But here's what I said 30 years ago, almost, about Romans 8.28. 
Why among all the passages in the Bible is Romans 8.28 so priceless? The answer is as complicated as it is profound. Hope. When the faithful employee arbitrarily loses their job and is thrust hopelessly into a marketplace with no work for someone their age. When a young family is brutalized by the sudden and tragic death of their child. When the respected minister crashes and burns in a tragic fall from fidelity. When the doctor says it's malignant. The lawyer says we'll see you in court. The teenager says if you really love me you'd understand. The person across the desk says, maybe next time. The officer at the door says, I'm sorry to tell you this. The minister says, you'd better sit down. Romans 8.28 doesn't promise us that we can explain everything that is happening. It doesn't mean that all of our answers, our questions have answers. It doesn't mean that our lives are always right side up. Romans 8.28 and the letters SDG simply mean that there is always, always hope. I wrote that 30 years ago. And I realize some of you are sitting there going, yeah, there's two or three of you going, that was good. But the rest of you are going, Dave, you got to come up with some new material. That's 30 years ago. But I still believe it, you see. I still believe that it's absolutely true. It's as true then as it is today. What does SDG mean? Well, SDG doesn't mean what, what we like to think that that plaque means. And, the, and those plaques are good. They're good to reminders. All things work together for good. Your grandmother's neater point pillow is, is a good reminder. And I know that we say, that, isn't that nice? Isn't that sweet? That you can have this all things work together for good kind of hope. But I don't need that. Don't you? What is the alternative? All things don't work together for good? All things work together to make a mess? All things work together for chaos? The world is just random and arbitrary? That nothing means anything? That your life doesn't matter? That there is no meaning? That's the alternative. The alternative to that nice needle-pointed pillow in your grandmother's parlor is chaos and meaninglessness and hopelessness. But Romans SDG doesn't mean, and Romans 8.28 doesn't mean that we know everything, that we understand everything, that we know how, how the symphony will unfold. We just know that when all is said and done, we know what Bach And we know what Handel knew, that God will get the glory in all things. Did they sign SDG on their compositions that were mediocre? Of course they did. Because they understood all of it, the good and the bad, the beautiful and the awful, the mediocre and the excellent, all give glory to God. It is our hope. It was the hope of the reformers. The reformers hoped for the same thing. The ones who came up with Soli Deo Gloria, the ones who came up with the original SDG, they didn't live a life of luxury. They didn't live like princes or kings. Many of them fought actual physical battles. Some of them were martyred. Most of them lived humbly and in in small churches where, where they were oppressed by their Catholic neighbors. But they believed that in all things, soli deo gloria. This is what SDG means. It can represent what the UN wants us to believe, sustainable development goals. It can mean that. Or it can mean some things that you suggested. I want to see what our survey said or some of the answers. Did we get some answers from the Menti survey? Oh, okay. Here's one. Uh, from you, super dad goals. That's a good one. Super dad goals. Sneezy, dopey, and grumpy. Okay. I, I like that. Sled dog gang. That's random. Uh, stealing Dave's goodies. Yeah, I, I, I didn't want to read to you half of what the staff had. D was Dave in the middle, and it was not pretty. Do we have any other ones? 
Silence during golf. Yeah. Huh? VGA, that's appropriate. Are there any more? We got another one? Sit dog good. <laughs> really? This is how creative we are? Sit dog good? See Jane run? Are there any more? Spiritual do gooders. Uh, yeah, that's shallow. Um, <laughs> any more? Savory dog gravy. <laughs> That's, that's, like, that's like simply delicious guacamole. Any more? Summer done good. Uh, summer done bad right now. 900 degrees. SDG. SDG. Soli Deo Gloria. It is the hope that in all things, God is at work for the good. It is for God's glory. This is our final exam, and your final exam is a take-home exam. It's a take-home exam where you can look at your life and either say, it's all random and arbitrary and meaningless, or I can say SDG. If you ever get an email from me or a letter from me, you'll notice that I picked up Dr. Dirk's habit, and I've done it for over 30 years. Every time I sign a correspondence, I sign SDG and my initials, because I believe that God is at work in all things for good. This is your final exam, and we're going to put that to the test next week, because next Sunday we're starting a new series, and we are going where angels fear to tread. We are going to jump onto the third rail. I am going to stick my head in the lion's mouth. And here at Riverbend Church on Sunday morning, we are going to talk about politics. <laughs> and it is a series that has one of the best names of any series that I have ever done in my life. And it came from our creative arts pastor, Tylen Taylor. And the title of this series is When the Right is all that's left. Next Sunday, we're going to put SDG to the test. Happy Father's Day. Class dismissed. See you next week.